Peace and love, everybody. It's your host, Nikita X, and this is the third episode of the show, Black Movement Radio. And the title today, we will be discussing how Asian slaves became Indians. I'm going to go into depth about how Chinos became reclassified as Indians or indigenous people. Moreover, while indigenous people were reclassified as African and Negroes, Chino slaves were allowed to obtain an indigenous identity and status. The main source of information used for this discussion will be from the book Asian Slaves in Colonial Mexico, From Chinos to Indians by Tatiana Sayas. What's interesting here is that the subject of Asian slaves in Spanish America is not discussed or widely known. In fact, in Tatiana Seas book, she states that her book is the first that traces Chino origins in Asia. My goal in this particular episode is to touch on key points which is not readily known to the public. All right. After parts of Asia were conquered by the Spanish crown, Asian people were put into slavery on their own land and later on shipped to places such as Mexico, Peru, and Chile. In other words, they were shipped to Spanish-controlled colonies in America. Now, this is a quote from the book, Asian Slaves in Colonial Mexico. Quote, the foundation of the Spanish Philippines gave rise to the trans-Pacific slave trade. Manila became the colonial outpost in Asia where slaves were purchased and the Manila Galleon ships afforded transport to Mexico. Manila was a slave society during the 17th century. Slaves did the majority of the labor and master-slave relations shaped the general social order. Within years after the Spanish conquest, the bustling port city had some 40,000 residents of diverse origins. A full quarter of this population was enslaved. They were craftspeople, manual laborers, and servants who upheld their master's social structure. By the 1620s, the city had 8,000 indigenous slaves and 2,000 foreign slaves, in addition to an untold number of Muslim slaves. The whole of the city, the whole of the city was a slave market, supplying labor to Spanish colonists and indigenous elites. Slave auctions were held in the plazas found within the city walls, and masters also sold slaves through individual transactions. The unorganized nature of the market makes it nearly impossible to quantify the volume of slaves, but it is clear that Manila was an emporium for slaves. Masters from throughout the Philippines knew to come to the capital to secure chattel property. Now these slaves were from diverse places and they were called Chino slaves. And they came from places such as Filipinos, India, Philippines, India, Bengal, Indonesia, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, Japan, China, and other places. Now once in Mexico, all of these people became Chino slaves. Now, here is a backstory of what took place in the Philippines. And what took place in the Philippines also mirrors what took place in America when both empires, the Philippines and America, fell to the Spanish crown. I'm going to read a page from the book Asian Slaves in Colonial Mexico, and it's from page 46. Okay, it said, it says, quote, the Spanish government instituted the same forms of labor organization in the Philippines as in the American colonies, first allowing colonists to have encomitas and then pushing for reform with the reptimento system. 
under Encomitas, a Spaniard was allowed was allotted a group of Indians who owed him personal service. Repartimento was a crown control system that required Indians to work for nominal pay. Okay, so I use that quote just to show how what happened in the Philippines and the Americas, they operated under the same types of system, which was pretty much a caste system where the lighter skin would kind of become the um, the Chino slaves or the Indians. And then at the bottom, you would have the reclassified indigenous people uh, being reclassified as Negroes working uh, at the bottom in the sugar plantations and in the fields and the rice plantations. Okay, so that's why I use that quote to show that both the Philippines and Spanish America, now Spanish America, um, were under the Spanish crown. And the type of system that operated was the same in the Philippines and it was the same in Spanish America, right? Now, at this point in history, the indigenous people were being subdued and people belonging to the lighter skinned races helped the colonists subdue the real indigenous people of the land. A clear example of this taking place is in the Philippines. Quote, in the Philippines, both systems allowed for slavery because the native elites were responsible for delivering the laborers to the Spaniards. The lawful enslavement of the indigenous group Negritos exemplifies the leeway given to native chiefs regarding slavery. The colonial government gave permission to the indigenous elites of the larger ethnic group to carry out their own slaving raids. The command Pangans, for example, who lived in a fertile province of Pamanga had license to enslave Negritos. The Kamapan, the Kapanmapagans, you understand what I'm saying, excuse me for the mispronunciation. The Kapamangans were allowed to go to war against their natural enemies, enslave them, and make them work in the rice cultivation. End quote. So later on, the Gritos were reclassified as Negroes and lost their indigenous status and became Negro slaves. Now, there are other words that um, that they say that the Negritos, that's their, they say they really are uh, Aeta, like A-E-T-A, okay? Um, because Negrito means little Negroes. And I'm not pretty sure, I'm not sure what they were called at that particular time when their nation was being subdued by the lighter skinned natives. But they were indeed reclassified um, as Negritos and they were forced to work on the rice plantation. And as you can see, uh, what happened with the Kappa Manpangans. They worked with the Spanish crown to subdue the true indigenous peoples of the Philippines. Okay. Meanwhile, in America, indigenous people were also being reclassified as Negroes and forced to work on plantations. Now, I'm going to use an example from the article titled The Use of Terms Negro and Black to include persons of Native American ancestry in Anglo-North America by Jack D. Fords. Quote, Negro was also used in a general way in the North American colonies. Some examples illustrate the use of Negro and Black as applied to people of American ancestry. An example is from the West Indies is especially illuminating. In 1764, William Young was sent 
to St. Vincent as a part of the British occupation of that island. Living on St. Vincent were about 3,000 Black Caribs or free Negroes, about 100 Red Caribs or Indians, and some 4,000 French and their slaves, according to Young. The British found it difficult to control the Caribs and wars were fought with them in 1771 through 1772, and again during 1795 through 1796. During the latter crisis, Young wrote an extremely anti-Carib tract designed to prove that the Caribs should be removed from St. Vincent. They were eventually defeated, and some 5,000 Caribs were shipped to an island near the coast of Honduras. Young was anxious to prove that the so-called Black Caribs were not Aborigines, but were in fact Negro colonists, free Negroes, or Negro usurpers. This was important to him because he wanted to show they had no bona fide land rights or Aboriginal title. This tendency continues, incidentally, amongst white scholars who even today refuse to accept the Caribs' avowed feelings of Indianness and continues to call them black. Now, this is, is what happened and what they still do today. Okay, so at that time, the indigenous people were fighting and were being reclassified as Negro and black, and there were some lighter skin uh, native peoples who were helping them, okay? I'm gonna read uh, a section from the book Asian Slaves in Colonial Mexico. And this is about um, another way that was completely a reclassification or what we would call a genocide uh, on indigenous people through reclassification, okay? So this is from the page uh, 110 in Asian Slaves in Colonial Mexico, all right? So, quote, the devastating demographic collapse of the indigenous population in the 16th century transformed the labor system in Mexico. The drop in population was almost inconceivable, approximately 15 million native people lost their lives between the 1530s and 1608 in central Mexico. So you mean to tell me in less than 100 years, 15 million native people died? They lost their lives or were killed? All right. And this is not to, to make light of the situation or to poke fun at it, but what I'm saying is that all of these people that they reclassified as Negroes, as African slaves, a lot of those people were indigenous people. But it makes it look like there was a complete slaughter or genocide of indigenous people when you just reclassify them. Then you can say they're all dead. But no, they're not dead. They've just been reclassified. They were reclassified by the pen. Okay? And we see that, that this actually happened with the Karankawas and it happened with the Yamasi people as well. All right? Now, let me get back uh, to the next part. All right. Now that dark-skinned aboriginals lost the war against the Spanish crown and now Spanish America, they were then reclassified as Negroes and Africans. The lighter-skinned native people who helped subdue the aboriginal people were allowed to maintain their indigenous status but they were still considered subjects or slaves of the Spanish crown and forced to endure a lighter form of slavery, which was not nearby as harsh as what the Aboriginal people had to experience. So this is the talking about how the Chino slaves became Indians, all right? <clears throat> the Chino slaves who were brought from the Philippines were people who were used to working underneath the Spaniards and the Spanish believed that they were easier to control the Negroes who were there. 
Once in Mexico, they worked in the textile fields, and though they were laborers, they were not forced to work out in the fields like the dark-skinned aboriginals, and they soon became identified as Indians, all right? Now, I want to read to you a section, if I can find it. If I can't, then I'm going to just leave it alone, all right? <clears throat> Let me, I believe I did find, I think I did find it, okay? Um, all right, here we go. Um, yes, all right, this is from page 109. This is a section from Asian Slaves in Colonial Mexico. Quote, Chinos were mainly servants because Spanish colonists character, characterized slaves who came from the Philippines as being more domesticated than black Negroes. The same quality was attributed to Indians who were considered to be naturally obedient and to have an aptness for service. In addition, Chinos were identified as good servants because most of them had some knowledge of Iberian languages, customs, and practices which they gained in the Spanish Philippines or Portuguese India. This cultural affinity, moreover, encouraged some masters to treat Chino slaves as they did Indians, which meant having slightly more regard for their natural liberty. All right? In addition to personal service, a large number of Chino slaves were employed in textile mills in Mexico City and its environs. Royal officials were particularly vigilant of this urban industry because it was notoriously exploitative of Indian laborers. Chino slaves benefited. Chino slaves benefited from this oversight because they were increasingly identified as Indians themselves. Chino slaves thus labored in occupations that enabled them to become free Indians, a status that was eventually confirmed for all Chinos. All right. So this means that when they were first, when the, when the Chinos were first brought to Mexico, they had already experienced of the Spaniard uh, customs and they knew their, some of their languages, and they knew that they would be easier to control because their mind had already been um, domesticated, or what you would say, they had already been brainwashed, to make it simple, okay? That they didn't fear them having an uprising because they felt like they had already conquered them. So they were able to just come in and kind of amalgamate themselves um, with the Indians and as time went on, they began to be seen as Indians and treated as Indians. All right. Now I'm going to give you an example of how a Chino slave became an Indian. All right. This is from, again, from the book Asian Slaves in Colonial Mexico. Quote, as in Iberia, the capture and sale of Muslims was permitted under canon and secular law. In 1570 and again in 1620, the king declared that it was legal to enslave Muslims in the Philippines. Two Spaniards testified that Bartolome was indeed a slave because he was a son of Maria Combexo, a Muslim slave who traveled with her master, Governor Tabora, to Mexico where Bartolome was born. No doubt, Maria Combexo was a legal slave because the just war theory did indeed allow the enslavement of women and children. Maria, however, had to undergo forced conversion and she also relocated to Mexico, which transformed her into a China slave. In this different colonial context, the son of a Chino, Chino slave could indeed take on the identity of an Indian. Let me read that again. Maria, however, had to undergo forced conversion and she also relocated to Mexico, which transformed her into a Chino slave. In this different colonial context, the son of a Chino slave 
could indeed take on the identity of an Indian. Once in Seville, Bartolome knew to claim he was an indigenous person because that is exactly what other Chino slaves did in Mexico. They became Indians to be free. Okay? Let me give you another example. Quote, Chinos, like Francisco, followed in the path of free natives of the Philippines who immigrated to Mexico. The Filipinos, confusingly called Chinos as well, laid the groundwork for Chino slaves who, like themselves, became indigenous vassals of the Spanish crown after Chino slavery was abolished in 1672. Over time, all of their diverse ethnic identities were folded together into one Indian identity. Filipinos thus became part of an increasingly multi-ethnic population and took part in redefining Indian identity in Mexico, end quote. But this did not work. Redefining yourself did not work for all Chinos, especially the ones who were probably the indigenous people uh, of that, that particular land, but the ones who looked more so like the Negritos, they were not able to uh, reclassify themselves as Indians, okay? Uh, so while the Chinos who kind of had that particular, you know, who were lighter skinned, they were able to transform themselves into being indigenous and be accepted as Indians, but the darker skinned ones were not allotted that privilege. All right, let me go to the quote. All right, quote, as the 17th century wore on, inquisitors increasingly looked to skin color to make the distinction between who was a slave versus who was an Indian. The logic was as follows. An Indian was someone who, quote unquote, looked like an Indian. Chinos looked like Indians, so they were Indians, not slaves. Slaves were people with African features. For instance, in 1665, an elder turned in a runaway Chino slave who had blasphemed. Some testified he was a mulatto slave, and others called him Negro. The wording of these testimonies suggests that in 1665, the word black was being used for slave. The accused did not have to testify or even identify who he was. The judge simply accepted the categorization of the Spanish witnesses and treated him as a slave. The unnamed Chino looked like a slave, so he was under the court's jurisdiction. Individuals who had African features or whom witnesses described as castas, meaning people of mixed heritage, were not identified as Chinos or Indians. Individuals who did not resemble Indians, in other words, maintained, remained under the court's purview. So this means that if you had some African features, they'll just throw you in a bunch and call you an African. Or they'll just call you black or a Negro and you will just be a slave. Okay, so that's how it worked. It was pretty much a caste system. All right. <clears throat> Here's another example where it did not work out, okay? Quote, notably, some owners tried to circumvent the law altogether by intentionally changing the ethnic category of their slaves. Check this out. Let me read this again. Notably, some owners tried to circumvent the law altogether by intentionally changing the ethnic category of their slaves. In July 1672, when Monterosa's liberation campaign was already underway, Juan Lopez Maraquin traveled all the way from Zacatecas in Mexico City to sell a slave named Antonio. 
to certify the property transfer. One provided several documents, including an old power of attorney in which Antonio was categorized as a Chino slave. The bill of sale, however, listed Antonio as a mulatto and noted that he was branded on the chin. One must have realized that he was about to lose his property if he kept Antonio in the northern frontier, so he took a long journey. Somewhere along the way, Antonio became a slave who had African ancestry, perhaps because he had darkish skin. One also took the added precaution of having Antonio marked as a slave on the most visible place on his body. Having forced this transformation on Antonio, one was able to sell him to a buyer who undoubtedly counted on keeping Antonio imprisoned in his textile mill. Okay, so that's how that worked out for the darker skinned Chinos who had these African features. They were reclassified, their ethnic origin was changed, and all of a sudden they became African. Okay, same thing that happened to us who are indigenous here to America. We somehow now are African Americans. You know, we've been classified as um, Negro, colored, black, Afro-American. Now all of a sudden we're African Americans, okay? So um, let me just keep going. All right. Chino slaves were not indigenous to America, but were allowed to reclassify themselves as Indians to be seen as indigenous Americans legally. They blended into the indigenous population, learned their culture, and were able to obtain certain rights. They were able to do this because the Spanish government, who controlled Mexico and other places in Spanish America, including the Philippines and colonized areas in Asia, allowed them to reclassify themselves. Soon after, the Catholic Church supported them in this endeavor as well. The Catholic Church supported them in this endeavor. Even with their newly obtained status as Indians, Chino slaves were not independent people, but were merely subjects of the Spanish crown. Quote, throughout the Spanish empire, colonized indigenous people were generally called Indians in reference to their geographic origin in the Eastern and Western Indies. More importantly, the word denoted that they were people who had been conquered, forced to accept Spanish sovereignty over their land and made to pay a tribute. In return, Indians had a distinct legal and fiscal status as vassals of the Spanish king. Okay, so this has been a rundown of what took place in colonial Mexico and what took place in the Philippines and how Chino slaves became Indians. Um, keep in mind that all Chino slaves, except the ones who had African features, were reclassified as indigenous peoples. Okay, and um, I would recommend everyone to get the book Asian Slaves and Colonial Mexico by Tatiana Sayas, just to get, um, if you want to read about some more examples and some uh, other events that occurred, then you should go and uh, also get the book. This was a brief rundown of how Chino slaves became Indians, how darker skinned peoples were reclassified as Africans, um, and how even though these people uh, called Chino slaves turned, turned so-called into Indians and indigenous peoples, they were still basically slaves to the Spanish people, to the Spanish crown, okay? So it wasn't really, though their, um, though their enslavement was a lot easier and they benefited from it, they were still not free. They were still 
uh, being controlled. And, you know, they were forced. They It said that they had said, hey, I give up my rights. I'm going to pay a tribute to the Spanish crown. So, you know, um, this is just how it worked out. So peace and love, everybody. Uh, any questions, you can post them below. And uh, thank you for listening. I'm your host, Nikita X. And this is the third episode of Black Movement Radio. Peace, love, and light.